There's a question we could ask as a way of continuing our discussion of jouissance, and it's a question which will lead our inquiries in some lectures to come when we start to think about the role of clinical structure in, in Lacan's work. The question, simply enough, is for whom, for what kind of subjects, is jouissance not a problem? I've tried to stress and underline that for neurotic people, people who repressed, who are prone to guilt, yeah, okay, looking at me, uh, their jouissance is a problem. Their jouissance can be seen as disgusting or something that they would rather allocate somewhere else, blame someone else for it. But for one group of subjects, jouissance is not a problem. Who might they be? That's our hanging question of today. But what I'd like to do now is introduce an example which, which proved really helpful to me. It's the example of profanity, of swearing, and by extension of hate speech. The reason I found it useful is, well, there's twofold reason. One is because sometimes we have a rather crude differentiation uh, where people say, well, jouissance is the stuff of the real. It's this kind of embodied uh, substance, this embodied uh, thickness. Uh, it's not something that's in captured by language. Okay, I get that. I agree with that. But on the other hand, you could say that in the instance of swearing, we have an example where signifiers, words, which are certainly operative, which are certainly injurious, which can certainly be violent, seem to become infused with a kind of excess charge. And I suppose my argument is simply to say that I think in the case of maybe blasphemy, as well as profanity, as well as injurious speech, you've got certain signifiers and words which are no longer operating simply as symbols or signifiers but have somehow become infused with this kind of noxious stain, with this uh, dirtying excess of jouissance. Another reason why I think this is a useful example, if we're trying to get to grips with jouissance, I found it, as I mentioned, very helpful, but also I think it points to how other frames of analysis, particularly, let's say, social, psychological, or more rational uh, analyses of swearing, aren't able to offer the account that a Lacanian psychoanalytic account of jouissance can. So what I have in mind is, um, I think it's a 2006 book by Steven Pinker. He does a kind of overview of a whole series. I think it's the Stuff of Thought book. And uh, he does a whole overview of various facets of social psychology. And in one section of the book, he starts to try to explain why, in his terms, swearing has a certain zing factor. And he comes up with a whole series of explanations, which he admittedly is not quite uh, satisfied with himself, but they include things like, well, what would the connotations of the words be? Or in everyday swearing, what, what is the referent? What is the thing actually referred to? And it's typically a rather unpleasant thing. Uh, is there a sense that, uh, particularly within that, you could call it the fecal imaginary of certain swear words, that there's something that's a contaminant, that's bad for us? He goes through all of these uh, he, all of these different types of explanation, and he feels rather unsatisfied with them, as am I. At one point, though, he does say, he makes this note, he says, isn't there sometimes in speech a kind of potent emotional charge? He, he does seem to get almost there, and of course, for me, his explanations remain inadequate without trying to understand the notion of jouissance. So how would we reformulate that in more Lacanian terms? I think what we'd have to say is that when injurious speech, hate speech, uh, profanity is operating, we have not just signifiers any longer, and not just signifiers referring to reference outside of the language domain, the kind of ideas that attach to them. Rather, it is as if speech has, and those particular signifiers have become freighted, have become loaded, infused with this uh, obscene quality this uh, excessive libidinal facet, which we have been calling jouissance. Jouissance, to me, seems the right concept to try and explain something of that. In a paper that I wrote a couple of years ago, I tried to, to explain this, and I did it in these terms. Consider a derogatory term, not in a sanitized form of a dictionary definition, but as it might be used in a verbal attack. There is something in the delivery of such an insult that exceeds the purely symbolic function of a signifier. That word has become infused with an offensive charge, an offensive charge of enjoyment. It's no longer a somehow neutral signifier. It has come to exude a dirtying excess, nicely captured, I think, in matters of dirty mouths, foul speech, 
There is, moreover, a certain relish on the part of the speaker in the profane qualities of the words they're using. There's a kind of deliberate transgressive, a, a deliberate transgression, a reflexive appreciation that the speaker has in their own offensiveness. There's a kind of relish in the part of the speaker. Now, why do I mention some of these things? Well, I think it helps. The first point is just to say that I think the concept of jouissance helps us understand why that speech is as offensive as it can be, precisely because it's loaded with this uh, uh, jouissance, this dirty and contaminating smear, this, uh, this excess. But I also want to suggest that we need to think about profanity because it means that it's much harder now to separate jouissance and speech. They can be interwoven. And moreover, one of the arguments, one of the questions we considered before was to what extent is jouissance within the symbolic? Now, at one level of the question, we've said that jouissance is the bodily real, so it's not codified, it's not reduced to words. But on the other hand, it's not happening completely outside of a symbolic frame, or as I believe I put it up here somewhere, it doesn't float free of the symbolic. Jouissance doesn't float free of the symbolic realm. And we know that because it has a kind of parasitic relationship to the ideals and values that have been enshrined in that symbolic realm. My example of swearing, my example of profanity, I think helps that. Because it is as if there is a relish in one's own offensiveness when one is delivering that insult. In other words, to swear, one knows, one needs to know that one's offending the big other. One needs to know that one's offending the big other. One needs to choose the words and the way of delivering the insult. So it is offensive. And in that respect, as jouissance is operating in that type of speech, it's not outside the symbolic. It precisely needs to be parasitic upon the ideals of the symbolic to be offensive in the first place. Okay, so I think we've managed to do a little bit of work with that. And it's a useful example, perhaps if you're trying to explain jouissance or this uh, added element, the zing factor in, in, in uh, Pinker's explanation, well, in his terms, I don't think he has a good enough explanation. That's a nice way of, of approaching it. One of the key themes I wanted to address today, fantasy and the law. In doing that, we can do a little bit of a mashup. As you'll see here, I've suggested that we can, we can mash up James Spader and Thomas Aquinas, kind of like this idea. Both of them, James Spader, the actor, the famous American actor who's in Boston Legal. Yeah, I know it's old. I know it wasn't a great TV show, but hey, what can I say? I watched it. It's a great example. We could think about how James Spader is a useful way of bringing to the forefront a point made by Thomas Aquinas. So let's quickly do that. And then we've got another mashup coming and that's, uh, well, we've got three. We've got the Beatles and the Stones, who I think will help us do a kind of humorous illustration of a, a key conceptual difference. And we've also got Freud, who makes in Totem and Taboo an interesting comment where he speaks of participation in the same substance. And I want to compare him to or read him via uh, a, a British television program dude called Bruce Parry. So we'll speak a little bit about that as we go on. So let's quickly do the, the James Spader uh, as a reader of Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas, famous philosopher, has got this line. He's got this line where he says, let's see if I can get this right. The blessed in the heavenly kingdom will see the torment of the damned so that they may even more thoroughly enjoy their blessedness. So this is worth a double take. What are you actually saying? The idea here is that if you're well behaved on earth in this mortal realm, if you are good, then when you go to heaven, you will get a little bit of extra. And he does well, I don't know if you use it in the original non-translated version, but the version that I found the word enjoyment is there or enjoy. That when you go to heaven, if you've been a good person, you don't just get rewarded by going to heaven. You get an extra libidinal reward. You get to enjoy precisely by watching the poor damned souls in hell suffer. Well, this is kind of a statement. Of course, you can see why I'm interested in it, because if we're suggesting that there is, and I am, there's a complicated, interesting, fascinating relationship between jouissance and law, which incidentally is another way in which jouissance does not float free of the symbolic, but is part of, or needs to be understood against within workings of the symbolic. 
If we take Thomas Aquinas's quote as a case in point, we would have to then say that there's an interesting law between jouissance and, not an interesting law, an interesting relationship between jouissance and law. I try to note that down here when I've said we've got a kind of unexpected intimacy between jouissance and the law. What's my James Spader example? In James Spader, not in James Spader, in one of what I think is one of the highlight moments in a standout career. I hope he's not watching this. James, if you're watching this. Okay, so there's a moment in Boston Legal where he's acting as uh, an attorney and he has a rather difficult task ahead of him. He has a client who is very rich, very young, very uh, rich, young, opportunistic woman who has married a, a very, no, she's not rich, sorry, a very young, beautiful woman who's married this much older guy who was like 95. He dies six months after they get married. And now there's some suspicion that maybe she had something to do with his, his death. So she's in a court of law, James Spader is the lawyer, and it's not looking good. The, the jury doesn't like her, and there's a, a, a kind of animosity filling the courtroom because she's totally unrepentant. She says, I hated him. I just married him for his money. I didn't like him at all. I'm glad he's dead. Which, of course, doesn't really make the jury like her an awful lot. So poor old James is losing the case, and it's in the final day of deliberations, and he's got to somehow, he's got to somehow make his case. So what he does in the final sum up of his concluding arguments, he says, here's my, here's my, uh, the person I'm representing. I think that maybe there's something a little awry here. Do you guys know what schadenfreude is? Schadenfreude is, I promised you we'd get back to schadenfreude. Here we are. Schadenfreude is when people get a certain satisfaction or personal enjoyment when they see some horrible thing happen to someone that they don't like. And I think we need to be objective in this court of law. And my own sense is that, sorry to say it, there's some kind of schadenfreude thing happening here. And so this isn't going to really work out. This is not going to be a fair verdict. Let's go to the conclusion of the show. James is successful. The jury feels somewhat shamed. They do indeed dislike her, and that was prejudicing their judgment. Now, in both of these examples, then, I think we start to get a sense of how jouissance, this kind of impassioned uh, 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 anger in this respect, this impassioned plea for justice, and in fact, that's a nice way of putting it, the impassioned demand for a certain kind of justice at some point along the Mobius strip that flips, it's, it's, at one point, it's an impassioned plea for justice and a hope for righteous, legitimate, objective justice. But how do we avoid flipping that over into something which is, becomes an embodied type of hatred? This is the kind of crucial uh, crisis at hand. There's another, and I think both of those examples show that. So two implications from that. Number one, Slavoj Žižek often develops this point. We could argue, we could ask, we could argue, is there ever a purely innocent form of law? Is there ever law that's just a symbolic, objective instance of written law that we do our best to follow? Perhaps, we're being idealistic about it, perhaps we could say that's one facet of law, the symbolic law, which has not been invested with values. But you could argue that whenever law is effectively operative, that it has already been given that unholy animation, as I put it up here, an unholy animation of jouissance. And at that point, law can flip into something quite vicious. There's an interesting moment in uh, Marjan Satrapi's Persepolis, which many people know. It's also famously a film. It's a really great graphic novel, and uh, it basically details her life where she's living in Iran. And of course, there's the, the Iranian Revolution. And her family is a kind of middle class, uh, kind of bourgeois family. They do lots of stuff. They go off to the opera or whatever. And, and they're shocked by how quickly things seem to change in the revolution. They're, they're shocked by how quickly a new mode of law starts to, to operate. And they're also, she is shocked as well by the fact that somehow 
neighbors who used to be good friends seem to be quite willing to, to rat them out, to be able to tell the authorities that they're doing something that's not quite right. And poor old Marjan is always getting into trouble because she likes punk music and she's wearing sneakers and she doesn't keep her head covered or whatever. And ultimately, you could say one way of trying to understand what happens in that situation, and it's not just here, okay, because otherwise people say, oh, well, jouissance is only a problem in a kind of fundamentalist era. It's not just there. But one way of trying to understand it is that law, as it were, becomes perverse, becomes perverted, becomes obscene when it becomes so thoroughly part of the economy of enjoyment of individual subjects. It becomes animated with the enjoyment, the libidinal rewards I get with, well, that person wasn't wearing the right shoes. I'm going to tell someone about it. So at that point, you have this moment when law flips over into, you could say, to be a bit colorful about it, evil. Let's start to draw to a conclusion. There's a whole lot of other topics we still need to address, but let's think about the, the Beatles versus the Stones thing. Let's also then think about, well, how do we do to get out of this trap that even when we have a revolution, and let's say it's a good revolution, it's an absolutely necessary revolution. Let's say it's the French Revolution. Let's say it was overdue. Let's say that it's animated by liberty, equality, all of these uh, honorable ideals. How do we manage to slow down the animating passions that enable a revolution to happen before they start to become inflamed by a kind of combustible hate? A combustible hate, which means that in the famous phrase, the revolution starts to eat its own children. How do we manage that, that balance where you need a certain jouissance, presumably, to fight social injustice, to, to make sure that certain laws are honored. But at that same moment, it's almost like one has got to take the risk of lighting a match near gasoline. Because in many instances, the fury, the, the indignant anger, those passions, which might be quite honorable, can become inflamed to such a point that the whole revolution gets burnt down, or the children of the revolution get burnt with it. Now, some people might say this is a kind of reactionary point that I'm making. So, up to you if you want to make that point. But I think it's an important point, both clinically and in terms of broader socio sociological questions of the political. And maybe now it's becoming clear why I make the Stones versus the Beatles reference. It's not mine. Christian Dunker, a colleague of mine in Sao Paulo, made this comment when I was doing a talk. The idea then would be, <clears throat> how do we manage to avoid law becoming evil, law becoming infused with a kind of contaminating jouissance of hatred? It's a difficult question. And maybe, maybe it's idealistic to think that we ever can. That's one way of responding to it. But there is one potential answer, and that comes from Alain Badiou, French philosopher. He's not the only one, but he's one person who tries to give us an answer to that. And he becomes very interested in St. Paul. And St. Paul, of course, has had exactly the same problem. For him, one of the crucial elements in Christianity is that it does foreground this problem. Whenever you have law, you are going to also have all of the negative energies. The, St. Paul doesn't use the word, of course, but the jouissance that goes along with the implementation of law. You have a paradox of law. When there's law, there's also the potential, and it's not just the potential perversion of the law. You could say that it's almost instantaneously part of the law itself. If the law is to survive by animating subjects in a given community who wholeheartedly embody and want to police and patrol and uh, endorse and extend that law. So how do you get around that problem? Well, for St. Paul, he's going to suggest that something like love, or more precisely, something like agape or Christian love might be one way of, of avoiding this uh, conflagration of jouissance and law. 